This is part two of the three part series. If you haven't seen the first one, I highly recommend that you do. Anyways, at this point in time, the Cold War was getting quite chilly, and even though both nations could already mutually assure destruction to each other, they wanted to do it more efficiently. The Americans developed two new ICBMs, which would later be used for spaceflight. The main one was the Atlas 65 D. The second missile was the SM 65A or HGM 25A Titan 1. Great naming system you got there. It was developed as a backup in case the whole Atlas thing failed. We'll talk about the Titan later on when it actually starts getting used for spaceflight. The Atlas was quite infamous for its one and a half stage design. You see, with regular two stage rockets, you would just ditch the fuel tanks and everything else under the second stage. But the Atlas would just ditch two of its engines when it didn't need the thrust anymore. The way the rocket was configured, it had two high thrust sea level engines and one vacuum optimized engine, which would have a higher ISP in the upper atmosphere. The sea level engines were needed at the start of the flight because the missile was chock full of heavy rocket fuel, but as fuel got used and the missile got lighter, it didn't need as much thrust, and leaving those heavy engines on would just be a waste. The tank structure of the Atlas was also quite interesting. You see, the tank itself had no rigid structure holding it up, and the material it was made of was incredibly thin. The only way it could withstand its own weight was the fact that the tanks were highly pressurized, keeping the structure rigid. And if the pressure ever got too low, it would just kind of crumple in on itself. Once the missile was developed, NASA took one look at it and thought, hmm, let's put a person on that. And the Mercury Atlas program was born. It started off with a couple of uncrewed test flights, with the fifth one housing a chimp. This was shortly followed by the iconic Friendship 7, which carried John Glenn into orbit. The success of this program led to NASA creating new variations of the Atlas rocket with upper stages. These variations of the Atlas rocket played a big part in the Mariner program. The Mariner program was a set of different probes meant to study Mars and Venus. But across the pond did some change. The Soviets had their own set of probes trying to reach our neighboring planets. The probes I'm talking about are the Venera probes. The Venera probes were launched atop a Molniya rocket. This rocket was developed for probes going beyond low Earth orbit. The Molniya rocket had a significantly larger upper stage than the previous Luna rocket. This larger upper stage was able to carry the payload and an additional fourth booster stage, which would boost the probe into a heliocentric orbit. The first probe was the Venera 1VA probe. Everything was going smoothly until the fourth stage failed. I see your Venera probe failed. Venera, uh, this is a Cosmo satellite. It's meant to do that. The Soviets launched Venera 1 eight days later, but it lost communications en route to Venus. Now you would think they would launch the next probe maybe a week later, but it actually took them one and a half years before they launched another. You see, for interplanetary travel, you can't just point your probe at a planet and fire the engine. That's not how it works. You have to launch in a certain period of orbital alignment called a transfer window. A transfer window occurs when the alignment of two planets is ideal for a spacecraft to move from one orbit to another. While it seems logical that these windows would happen when the planets are closest, Kepler's third law states that the further the planets orbit, the slower it goes. This is why transfer windows are the way that they are. Earth-Venus transfer windows only happen once every 19 months, so 19 months later they tried again. Venera 2MV1, number 1, escape stage failed. Venera 2MV1, number 2, the escape stage failed. Venera 2 MV2, number 1, exploded in orbit. 19 months later, Cosmos 27, escape stage failed. 19 months later, we got Venera 2, which lost communications en route to Venus. Notice how only the somewhat successful ones get the official titles? Oh my god, it's already 1965? And I haven't even mentioned the Mariner program yet. Like I said before, the Mariner program was a series of probes designed to study our neighboring planets. These Mariner probes were launched atop the Atlas Agena B rocket. So is Mariner ready to launch? Almost. I just gotta put this one thing in real quick. And now it is ready to launch. You misspelled Venus, dummy! Mariner 2, on the other hand, achieves the first flyby of Venus that successfully returned data. Mariner 3's fairing failed to separate, and Mariner 4 got the first flyby of Mars. There were more launches after this, but they happened way in the future, and I don't want to be talking about stuff in the 70s when I haven't even mentioned Voskhod yet. Speaking of Voskhod, the Soviets had developed the Voskhod capsule, which was essentially just a Vostok capsule with a detachable retro rocket mounted on the descent module. This capsule was a lot heavier than the Vostok, so it had to be launched on the Molniya rocket without the Block L stage. This capsule was the first one to have multiple crew, 
Because of this, they had to ditch the classic Vostok ejection seat and go for a parachute descent. This parachute would have tiny retro rockets that would fire right before landing to soften the blow of impact. After a few uncrewed test flights, Voskhod 1 launched without any major problems. Voskhod 2 was a bit different from Voskhod 1. First off, it had an inflatable airlock which would be used to perform the first ever EVA, or spacewalk. The main goals of this program were to conduct the first EVA and to beat the Americans at multi-crewed spaceflight. Once these achievements were accomplished so early in the program, they were like, I did my job, I'm going on break. And the rest of the missions were promptly cancelled and the resources being redirected to the Soyuz program. Which I will get to shortly, but first, remember the Titan missile from early in the video? Well, they made another one, and they're putting people on it. Project Gemini was America's try at multi-crewed spaceflight. This ship was split into three sections, the command module, the retrograde module, and the equipment section. Inside the spacecraft were different thrusters that would fire to control the attitude of the spacecraft. Some of these thrusters would be used for translation and maneuvering in space. These thrusters were added because one of the biggest goals of Project Gemini was to rendezvous in orbit. Rendezvous simply means to meet up. I don't know why it's spelled like that, I'm not French. Once all the orbital stuff was complete and the astronauts were ready to go home, the equipment section would separate from the retrograde module, revealing four retrograde thrusters which would slow down the spacecraft for re-entry. After re-entry, parachutes would deploy for a soft splash down to the ocean. However, the Gemini capsule was originally supposed to deploy some sort of paraglider and land on a runway. Because of this, the traditional launch escape tower wouldn't really work for this exotic kind of landing. So, they opted for an ejection seat. The whole Gemini project was actually quite ambitious. There was originally going to be a winged Gemini, a Gemini orbital laboratory, a big Gemini, a Gemini moon landing, and even a bigger Gemini moon landing. There were a few uncrewed test flights before Gemini 3 actually had people on it. After this, Gemini 4 had the first American EVA. Gemini 5 tested fuel cells that would be used on the Apollo program. Gemini 6 was originally going to be the first to rendezvous with the Agena docking target, but it failed to launch, so Gemini 6 was scrubbed. Instead, Gemini 7 was going to practice rendezvous with Gemini 6A. Since their docking ports couldn't actually dock, they just kind of got close to each other for a bit. Gemini 8 docked with the Agena docking target, which was just an Agena upper stage with a docking port on it. While docked with the Agena, Gemini 8 just started spinning faster and faster. They thought something was wrong with the Agena, so they undocked, but they just started spinning faster. Eventually, they found out that one of the roll control thrusters somehow turned on, and they had to use the re-entry thrusters to stabilize the craft. Gemini 9 couldn't dock because the fairing failed to separate, and Gemini 10 through 12 performed EVAs. These missions gained valuable knowledge for the Apollo program. But before we talk about that, I have to go over the Soyuz program. The Soyuz was kind of a jack of all trades. It was quite versatile and could be modified to do many orbital things. The Soyuz spacecraft was divided into three parts, the orbital module, the re-entry module, and the service module. The orbital module would usually have some sort of docking port, and the service module would house the engine, thrusters, solar panels, and electronics. Both the orbital and service module would be jettisoned prior to re-entry. The Soyuz program had a rough start with the tragic loss of Vladimir Komarov. Despite this tragedy, the Soyuz program continued, with the following missions being successful. Later on in the program, lunar variants were developed, like the Zond Pro, not that Zond, the other Zond, which was essentially just a regular Soyuz without the orbital module, and the LOK Soyuz, which was just a regular Soyuz with the beefed up service module. Okay, now let's talk about the Apollo program. The Apollo program started way back in 1960. For context, this was an entire year before they even put a man in space. So you can tell they were quite enthusiastic about this whole space thing. Remember Werner von Braun from the last video? Well, he was a German rocket scientist who played a big part in designing the Saturn rocket. Aside from this, he also designed some quite interesting looking rockets, to say the least. Back to the Saturn rockets he designed. The Saturn I was more of a test vehicle that would be used to test all the hardware for future missions. The lower stage of the Saturn I consisted of eight redstone fuel tanks surrounding one Jupiter fuel tank. The Saturn I-B was more of a standalone rocket. The upper stage was extended and little RL-10s were replaced by one J-2 engine. 
This whole configuration created the iconic S4B stage, which would later go on to be used for the third stage of the Saturn V. The Saturn 1B was able to carry the Apollo CSM into low Earth orbit. It was split into two parts, the command module and the service module. The service module was powered by an AJ-10 rocket engine. The service module would also have four radial RCS blocks, which would be used for docking and attitude control. The command module had its own set of RCS thrusters that it would use during re-entry. Atop this command module would be a launch escape tower that would pull the crew to safety in case anything bad happened. This launch escape system was actually tested on the Little Joe 2 rocket. If it were up to me, I would have called it the Big Joe, but I digress. To actually land on the moon, you would need a lander, but at this point, nobody actually knew if it was possible for something big and heavy to land on the moon. Yeah, the Soviets did land Luna 9 on the moon, but that was just like a balsa wood beach ball with an antenna, and it only weighed 200 pounds. So they decided to make their own probe that would land on the moon. Behold, Surveyor 1. It was launched atop the Atlas Centaur, and would have one big SRB in the middle that would slow it down most of the way. Then, its little retro rockets would kick in to finish the landing. The success of this mission proved that the moon's surface wouldn't collapse under the weight of something heavy. The Saturn 1B would only be able to carry the Apollo CSM to low Earth orbit. To actually get to the moon, you would need a super heavy lift vehicle that could carry the Apollo CSM, a lander, and a fully fueled S-4B stage into low Earth orbit. For context, that's as much as a fully fueled Atlas D missile and two Chevy Silverados. Oh, look at the time. The script of this video is already twice as long as the original. And these videos take so long to make, so please like and subscribe. It would really help out this channel. Stay tuned for part 3.